personally to be involved with because I handed over a, a fair amount of the lecturer recruitment to to Al Roth and and to Scott Commoners and uh, uh, one of uh, the the benefits of that is that uh, I also I also got Scott and and Al to participate as lecturers in the summer school and and now we'll have Scott uh, more or less picking up. I guess where, where I left off. Scott is uh, currently a uh, junior fellow uh, in the Society of Fellows at Harvard. Scott. Thank you. Well, I also have to start with thanks, picking up literally where Eric just left off. It was, it's been an incredible honor to be involved in the organization of this whole event. Um, and it's an honor to be here. And it's a really special and unusual and perhaps unique for the remainder of my career, I have no idea honored to be able to bridge between Eric Maskin and Al Roth. <laughs> so I will attempt to do it justice, um, but uh, this is a hard act to do. I'm going to be talking about how we get from one-to-one -one matching to many-to-one -one matching. And I'll show you sort of structural similarities between the different branches. Oops, sorry. And so we'll start, we'll quickly review what Eric just covered for the one-to-one -one marriage model, the Gail Shapley, so no transfers world. Uh, and the reason for this, a couple of pieces. First of all, we talked at the end about digestion. Um, I'm going to give a slightly different way of chewing over some of the notation and structure so that we can write everything down in terms of preference relations that's going to look very similar to the way we're going to do many-to-one college admissions matching. So, and especially because some of these things, you know, deferred acceptance is going to come up probably almost every lecture yeah, I think all but maybe all but one or two of the lectures we go through the summer school, I want to make sure everybody really has it. And so we'll, you know, do some quick mnemonics to try and remember how it works. You know, then we'll sort of speed through the results we just saw, and then I'll show you how they generalize and how we extend them to think about markets where one side of the market matches to multiple partners. Then, um, just because you know, it's never good enough to just prove one set of generalizations, I'll talk a little bit about an even further generalization, which will be many-to-many -many matching. So you know, the, the shorthand, one-to-one -one will be the marriage model. You're thinking about men matching to women or buyers matching to sellers with each side having unit demand or supply. Many-to-one will be college admissions. This is, you're thinking about students matching to schools or in the case of, uh, you know, the doctor residency match, which Al will talk about this afternoon, it's new doctors to their medical residency positions. Might also, as we talk about later, students to public schools or something like that. Many-to-many -many matching, think about consultants and firms. So firms may hire many consultants. Consultants might work for many distinct firms. Uh, there are also a few sort of simpler labor, labor markets, like the UK medical mat residency match, where you might be able to take sort of multiple internships at a time, while the hospitals, of course, hire multiple doctors. And then at the very end, assuming there's time, I'll talk a little bit about many-to-one matching with transfers. So this is taking off from the first part of Eric's lecture, where he talked about one-to-one -one matching with intra-household transfers. You know, we'll also be able to talk about what happens if we generalize that. So imagine now that there are, um, say, buyers who want to get uh, multiple sellers or firms that want to hire multiple workers, all of them being paid salaries. And so we'll see that the same types of ideas that work in you know, our world without transfers actually also are going to be able to find competitive equilibrium allocations in worlds with transfers. OK? That's the roadmap. Happy so far? Good. OK. So you should always start a lecture with a question you understand how to answer. So I'm going to lay out the, uh, the basic marriage model. And then I'm going to give you guys, a through a sequence of questions that I have some basic sense of, a quick way to think about the deferred acceptance algorithm. So we're going to imagine a society with a set of men and a set of women. And our principal question is, how can we arrange marriages so that there are no divorces? These assumptions all came up in the, previous, uh, you know, in the previous talk. I'm just going to write them down sort of in one place. First of all, we're assuming that agents have strict preferences. That's going to be true throughout my entire talk. Some of the types of theorems we'll prove have generalizations to weak preferences, but all of that we can talk about offline. We're going to assume bilateral rela relationships. So we're only going to have pairwise matching. And two-sidedness. So men only desire women, and women only desire men. I'll have one footnote about why we use two-sided markets a little bit later. And the last one, and this came up in one of the questions, we're assuming that preferences are fully known. So both people know their own preferences, 
and as far as the rest of the model, blocks can form. So if I, you know, if there's possible that there could be a block to a stable match, I know, you know, the block exists and can go and execute it. All right. So deferred acceptance built up from the ground up. Let's imagine that the set of men has only one element and the set of women has none. So how do I arrange marriages so in a world with zero men and one woman so that there are no divorces? OK, you guys are saying nothing, which is correct. You do absolutely nothing. Because there's only one man, no women. There are no marriages. Uh, let's make the problem slightly harder. How about one man and one woman? Depends on their preferences. That's right. So you could be that you want to marry, you know, just marry them. But maybe one of, there's one of these, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on planet Earth scenarios going on. And so it's actually the case that you know, we have to verify that both of them find the other one acceptable. And so one way to implement this is just to go and ask them, you know, which one of you, you know, do you find the other person acceptable? And if they both say yes, we marry them. OK, so this looks like deferred acceptance, except we only have one man and one woman. Right now, the man can walk across the room, propose to the woman. If she says, yes, I will marry you, we know that they both find each other mutually acceptable. If he doesn't want to propose or she doesn't want to marry him, we're done. All right, so now how about sort of a large number of men, still one woman? Turns out a version of this algorithm works again, right? If we have the men who want to propose to that woman go and propose, and the woman holds, you know, takes her best acceptable marriage proposal, we're again done. We have a, a no divorce matching because she has the best, you know, her favorite man who also wants to marry her. And so that's the first step of deferred acceptance, right? Each man proposes to his first choice woman. Each woman holds her most preferred acceptable proposal. If there's only one woman, we're actually going to finish at the end of this step. You know, if she has a proposal, we just marry her to, that, to her favorite man, and then we're done. But of course, it actually can't stop there in general. Because now, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some, if there are many women, some men who are rejected might come back and propose to a woman who you know, was holding a proposal from the first round, but likes this sort of previously rejected by somebody else man more. You know, so maybe my second choice woman actually has me as her first choice. And so I come and make a proposal to her in the second round, and now she wants to marry me. So deferred acceptance is just iterating this idea that we'd sort of like to learn the preferences iteratively but making it possible for us to discover sort of you know, blocks as you go along. And it's true, you know, we just saw this at the end. No, you know, if we, you know, at some point, there are finally many men and women in the world. At the end, if we marry the men to the women who are holding their proposals, then nobody wants a divorce. There's no unilateral divorce. The men only propose to acceptable women. The women only held acceptable proposals. And there's, there are no affairs. You know, so there's a man and woman who mutually prefer each other to their assigned matches. Well. The man prefers the woman, so he must have proposed to her earlier in the algorithm. But then she should have held him, a contradiction. OK, so the single most important thing you know, in, in the entirety of my talk, Eric already presented, and I just represented because I want everyone to walk away understanding deferred acceptance. This is a super, super important algorithm. It's going to be used in a lot of real world applications. It's going to generalize in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, in a couple of days, we'll see alternate characterizations of the stable outcomes found by this and other matching algorithms. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful idea. And I strongly recommend you go and read the original Gail Shapley paper. It's also extremely readable. OK, a little bit more notation. And as I say, we're going to move through this part very quickly. So this is, this is review, just relabeling. So a matching is going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence that assigns each man a woman or himself being unmatched. I will also, when I write preference relations, sometimes list being unmatched as an empty set just because it draws the eye faster, and assigns each woman a man such that each agent's match partner is assigned to him or her. Right? So if I look at your matches match, it's you. So a marriage matching is going to be stable if there are no divorces. What does that mean? Well, in particular, it means that everyone finds their assigned match acceptable, and there are no blocks. So blocks here, and note so the, the difference. So Eric introduced all of the uh, notation using, uh, using utility functions. Another way to write that down, we were sort of only using ordinal features of the, uh, of the preferences. So we can all write it down. We could write it all down in terms of ordinal data. So think about a man who, prefer, who is preferred by woman W to her assigned match. So W prefers M to mu of W. and W is preferred by M to mu of M. 
That's a block. They mutually prefer each other to their assigned matches. And again, this is exactly what Eric had with these, uh, these utility inequalities. But for most of today, we're just going to work in terms of the ordinal preferences. We won't actually need to assign a specific utility representation. OK? So theorem, Gail Shapley. We just saw it, uh, a stable marriage matching exists. In fact, there might be many stable matches. So we know about two of them, right? We know there's a, a man proposing or a, a buyer proposing stable match and a woman proposing or a seller proposing stable match. But actually, in principle, there could be a whole bunch of them. There's what's called a lattice. So for every stable pair of stable matchings, mu and nu, there's actually a stable match which sits above that match. In terms of, you know, what it means is that I can find for you a stable match that every man likes weakly more than both mu and nu. So he does weakly better than in either of these stable matches, and it too is stable. And moreover, there's a match that sits below it. Every man likes that one weakly less. So if you think about it, sort of there's a top point. Here's the male optimal stable match. There's some other stable matches here. And for any two, I can sort of move closer to that top point, possibly reaching it. And I can always move down. I can sort of also move against men's preferences. That's a lattice. I can always find an object you know, above and below. How do we prove this, incidentally? Think about the two stable matchings, mu and nu. Ask each man to point to his preferred partner out of mu and nu. I claim that every man is pointing at a different woman. So that feels very miraculous, right? You know, sort of said, everyone, hey, you've got these two potential matchings we're thinking about implementing in society. Point to your favorite wife. And you're sort of, the, uh, the price is right. Everyone points to a different wife. But it and that's going to be our, our new matching. The trick is that this is a consequence of stability. Right? Suppose two men are pointing at the same woman. Well, she has to prefer one of them. And that's going to block the match where she's matched to the other. But now it gets even juicier. So if all men weakly prefer a given stable match to another, then all women weakly prefer the other to the first. So as we move up towards the male optimal stable match, we're actually making the women weakly worse off. As we move down, we're making the men weakly worse off. So there's this fundamental opposition of interest between the men and the women. So there might be, in general, many stable matches. There's a male optimal and a woman optimal. And in between, we can sort of choose whether to make the men better off or the women better off as sort of we move around this, this algebraic structure. And then, it, yes? Uh, what would happen if the proposal size is changed? Good question. So the propo it, Last line on the slide, um, the man proposing deferred acceptance algorithm finds the man optimal stable match. The woman proposing deferred acceptance algorithm finds the woman optimal stable match. So the man optimal one here is the result of man proposing deferred acceptance. Woman optimal is down here, result of woman proposing deferred acceptance. Um, if you think about it, sort of Eric showed us that the man proposing deferred acceptance algorithm gets the men the best partners they can have across stable matches. You're sort of the, you know, the best possible partners, I think was the word you used. Um, this is sort of meaning that the men are getting the upper hand. Sort of every, you know, by proposing, they're getting to select their favorite point in the lattice by sort of holding as many options. Their opportunity set is as large as possible at every stage of the algorithm. And so that's where, that's where this last result comes from. It's also possible, incidentally, to find certain points on the inside of the lattice. So I mentioned it's large. It can be large. It can be small. We'll see examples over the next couple of days of certain circumstances under which we can say a lot about its size. But there are other results that sort of target specific points. Like there exists what's called a median stable matching that's sort of a, an ordinal midpoint in the lattice. All right? Yeah? That's a complicated question. Um, in, there is an algorithm in the case of one-to-one -one matching that finds, with strict preferences, that finds the complete set of stable matches. Um, in more general models, uh, depending on the preferences, there are often algorithms that in principle can find the complete set but may not run in polynomial time. Um, and to find specific target matches without enumerating the whole set is often hard, although I think maybe you can do it with median stable matching. I don't remember. Um, but, and there's this recent theory of quantile stable matchings where they've sort of characterized all the quantiles across this lattice. I don't know whether it comes with constructive arguments. Good question. 
All right. So I promised a footnote. This is sort of a parenthetical slide, hence the parenthetical in the title. Had I known the board was here, I would have drawn parentheses around it like so. Um, just two-sidedness is going to be very important today. And the you know, canonical example for that is what's called the roommate problem. This also goes back to Gail and Shapley's original paper, which has tons and tons of stuff in it. Um, so if we imagine sort of pairing people as roommates, so this is like one-sided matching, uh, sometimes we can have problems with stability. So for example, if we pair 1 and 2, sorry, if we assign yeah, 1, 2, that's his favorite choice. But 2, second choice, 2 would like to pair with 3. But now once 2 and 3 are paired, 3 has a second choice. He'll propose to 1. 1's unmatched, so he'll deviate with 3. And you go around in cycles. Looks kind of like a Condorcet cycle. Uh, correct, exactly. Um, or rather, this is preference. This is preference for yourself in this notation. So you'd always prefer to be matched to somebody in this in this setup. Good question. Um, so in this world, no stable roommate matching exists. And for a long time, we thought you know, there's a very developed theory of roommate problems, which I'm not going to go into today. So there there are things we know about these types of markets. Um, but for a long time, we thought that sort of two sidedness, which makes the math fundamentally more elegant and structured, uh, was actually really necessary. <laughs> For stable matching, um, but on Wednesday we'll talk about very recent discoveries. You know, uh, as recent as 2008 or so, um, that you actually don't need two-sidedness per se. What you need is sort of a particular type of structure, in, uh, in like a supply chain structure or a sort of a, a network with additional assumptions on preferences. Um, so we'll be able to move not quite towards a model that looks exactly like this, but where we get a little bit away from the two-sidedness assumption. But for today, we're two-sided. Um, so we saw opposition of interests. We saw that there's a uh, man optimal stable match here. This is the, uh, the J, J prime example again, and a woman optimal stable match. And you can get this opposition of interests for a very, very small number of agents. That's going to be key. Because it tells us that the strategy proof disk result that Eric pointed out is going to be extraordinarily general. Right? As soon as you have you know, four agents, two and two in your market, we uh, can't guarantee the existence of a strategy proof matching mechanism for both sides. We saw also that the set of uh, matched men and women is invariant across stable matches. So this is what's called the lone wolf theorem. Someone who's single in some stable matches, single at all stable matches. He's happy being single. Um, I'm going to very quickly give a second proof of this result, because I, uh, I like proving things via hieroglyphics. Um, so we're going to think about the man optimal stable match and consider any stable match. And now I've just, you know, I've, I've thrown some hieroglyphics on the board. So this will be the set of men matched under mu bar, and the set of men matched under mu, set of women, and set of women. And so first of all, I claim that the set of men matched under mu bar contains the set of men matched under mu. So why is this? So this is the man optimal stable match. Mu is also stable. Every man has to do at least as well in mu bar as he does in mu. So in particular, if he's matched under mu, in under mu, he has to be matched under mu bar. Right? Maybe to a partner he likes more, maybe to the same partner, but he has to be matched. Now, how about the women? I claim that mu of w has to be larger than mu bar of w. Well, why is this? So remember opposition of interests. So the man optimal stable match is the worst for the women. So no matter what stable match this is, mu, the women have to be doing at least as well as under mu bar. So same argument shows that if a woman is matched under mu bar, she has to be matched under mu. So now, the reason I'm showing this hieroglyphic proof is not just because you know, it's nice to draw a bunch of symbols. And I realize there's one more step. So there's, there's something that's going to appear here. But why, this is, this, all I'm using is this lattice structure. Right? I'm making strong use of this opposition of interest results from this lattice of stable matching that we saw earlier. And now we're almost done. So I've shown that this set's bigger than this one, and this set's bigger than this one. But how big are these sets anyway? They're equal. Why is that? Yeah, good. It's a stable. It's a one-to-one -one match. So for every man, there's exactly one woman. So this set is equal to this one in cardinality. And in fact, these sets are equal in cardinality too. But so now I have this loop that sort of goes around in a circle. These, you know. 
set containment inequalities actually have to be equalities. Same set of men, same set of women. All right? So that's a second cut of the lone wolf theorem. And again, sort of shows the power of thinking about the abstract structure of these matches as well. Right? So now we've seen sort of a, you know, I guess, both technically elementary proofs in the mathematical sense, but one proof that sort of uses the, uh, you know, uses the technical you know, the, the technical details of the problem, and another that sort of tries to stack on this existing lattice structure content. And both of these are very important in the generalizations. So being able to, you know, there's a lot of value in matching to being able to flip back and forth between the low-level details and sort of the, the specific features of each individual piece of the problem, and then some of these broad structural results. Um, and that'll be a continuing theme as well. OK, one more one-to-one -one result that wasn't covered earlier, but I want to show you because it has an extension to many-to-one -one matching, which in some sense is very recent. Uh, so another one of Al's uh, many results in this space, it turns out that there's actually a strong statement you can make about the man-optimal stable match, which is that it's weakly Pareto optimal in the sense that there's no individually rational matching mu, even unstable mu, but individually rational for everybody. So remember, that means nobody wants to walk away unilaterally. Such that this match mu is preferred by all men to mu bar. So that's kind of stunning. That says not only is stable matching sort of a very strong way to find something that feels you know, fair and stable in the sense of people reconnecting, but actually, even if I just sort of wanted to make the men better off, it would be hard to do that. Right? I can't do better for all the men while ensuring that nobody wants to walk away Without just, you know, the, without just going to the man-optimal stable match. So how do we prove this? So let's imagine that there is such a mu. Proof will be by contradiction. So now, mu matches every man to some woman who has two properties. First of all, finds m acceptable. That's because of individual rationality. We're not getting, it's an individually rational match. And second, must reject m under deferred acceptance. So why is that? Well. The man proposes down his order of preference list, this is the deferred acceptance outcome. So in particular, he must have proposed a mu of m at some point. And he didn't end up with mu of m, he ended up with mu bar of m, so he was rejected. OK. So this already feels a little strange somehow, right? We found some matching where the men are acceptable to the women, but they've actually been rejected under deferred acceptance. That's, that's starting to feel a little bit weird. So now, all the women in mu of m must actually be matched under mu bar. So why is that? Well, they rejected somebody under deferred acceptance, and they rejected somebody acceptable. So that means they must have gotten a better offer at some point. So mu bar, they've got some offer that they're holding that's in fact better than their, you know, their guy m from mu. OK. So now. What else have we learned? Actually, it turns out that all the men must be matched under mu bar. Why is that? Well, suppose there's a, you know, some man who's unmatched. Now we're going to violate our lone wolf theorem because the counts won't add up correctly. Right? So we have a woman for every single man in mu of m. And all those women are matched under mu bar. Which means in particular that we'd better have a woman for every, you know, a man for every single woman under mu bar. So all the men are matched under mu bar. Okay? And then finally, mu of m equals mu bar of m. Again, by lone wolf, we've sort of we've run out of women. We have one woman for every man. We, or sorry, we've run out of men. We have one woman for every man. We can't find any more women to assign because we have no partners for them. Now, almost there, I promise. It only goes to the bottom of the slide. There's no slide on this afterwards. Um, any woman who gets a last stage proposal must not have held any men. So this is the loopy one. This is, this is sort of hard to think about, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to it, walk it, you through it for two reasons. One, because I want to finish the proof. And two, because actually this type of argument is extremely common in matching theory. So what do I mean when I say a woman gets a last stage proposal? If you're a woman who receives a proposal in the very last step of the deferred acceptance algorithm, I claim you must not be holding a man at that point. 
OK, so why is that? Proposal's very last stage of the deferred acceptance algorithm. If you were holding somebody else, well, you'd have to reject that person. Right? And then it's not the last stage. Oops. Darn. Failed. Or you'd reject the man who proposed you, and then it's still not the last stage. He goes and proposes to somebody else. So by sort of nature of the fact that it's the last stage you know, of a finite algorithm, I actually learn something about what's going on in the algorithm. This is very common. There are a lot of arguments in matching theory that either have these look at the guy who goes last or look at sort of the first person to be rejected under a certain condition. All of these arguments that sort of pull out a distinguished person and show that they actually don't exist. Yep. Uh, good point. But we know, so in general, yes, the last step could be men just be, being unmatched, but we know here that all the men are matched. So that's, so we're actively using this step for the next one. Good question. Everyone see that? Cool. All right. So now there's at least one woman in mu bar of m who's single under mu because we know that these aren't all the same women. Right? You know, we sort of, it was any woman who gets a last stage proposal must not have held any men before. So in particular, there's some woman who gets that last stage proposal but wasn't holding anybody else. But in particular, if she wasn't holding anybody else, she certainly wasn't holding you know, anyone from M. Who was ma she wasn't anybody's mu, mu of M. She wasn't assigned to anybody in mu. Right? Because all the women in mu of M were matched under mu bar and had already rejected somebody. So that's the trick. So we run out, you know, at the very end, we find you know, some woman who's matched in mu bar of m, but is single under mu. And this contradicts the fact that these two sets of women are the same. Happy? Cool. So this is like a super powerful theorem. And look, we can prove it in like half a slide. Are we having fun yet? Party? Good. OK, um, last bit of the review, incentives. Uh, so we talked about this. I'm literally just going to put these on the board. Al showed that no stable matching mechanism exists for which stating true preferences was a dominant strategy for every, every agent. As Eric said, this is just direct from this uh, you know, two by two example. Um, and then on the other side, and this is very strong and very important for applications, the male optimal stable matching mechanism makes it a dominant strategy for every man to state his true preferences. And there are going to be strong generalizations of this result. And so again, when we're thinking about you know, quick preview, we're eventually going to be putting things like deferred acceptance into the real world. And there are lots of reasons to want strategy-proof mechanisms. They're easy for the players to use. They're going to be uh, you know, good for collecting data. We'll be able to learn people's true preferences. Like imagine a school choice system that can actually tell us which schools people want to go to. There's a lot of advantages to this. And so this theorem is going to be, and its generalizations are going to be really, really important. All right. So that wraps up our one-to-one -one matching review. Um, before I move on to many-to-one -to matching, I should pause and ask whether there are any questions. Yes? Using the long work theorem, yeah. the, using the fact that the third acceptance algorithm is the best for the match. Um, I used the existence of a male optimal stable match, but I didn't use deferred acceptance per se. Uh, Everyone see that? Cool. Further questions? Great question. Thank you. Um, that's a really useful clarification. So again, as I especially, I have a habit of proving things using abstract structure. Um, so you should like yell at me if I do it in a fashion that's unclear or where it's not clear exactly which pieces of the structure I'm using. Okay. I, I accept like yelling from the back of the room. Uh, be less abstract. More questions. All right. Well, so now we want to talk about. Uh, oops, sorry. Now we want to talk about students in colleges. Uh, another thing probably near and dear to the hearts of the people in this room. Uh, marriage, colleges. Market design is fun because we think about problems that we think about every day. And we prove interesting theorems like it's possible to marry everyone in society so that there's no divorce. You know, here we have some problems. Well, it turns out to not necessarily be a great model for the Yentas of the world, um, but works very well for other things that look sort of like this in, in more detailed ways, right? Like we're, you know, we sort of. In the marriage model, we assume that the market clears at a centralized system in a single time with people knowing their preferences. Um, and it's, in practice, it's actually a really hard to list your preferences over all potential marriage partners in the world. Um, 
I don't know if any of you have ever tried to do this, but you're certainly, as soon as you learn the deferred acceptance algorithm, you're tempted to do this and try and sort of figure out exactly what you would submit to the algorithm. Um, no? All right, well, fine. Uh, but colleges, we tend to apply to fewer of them than to potential romantic partners. So maybe we can believe these preferences a little bit more. Um, but speaking of which, what are our preferences going to look like? Um, same basic story, except now we have students and colleges. The colleges are going to accept multiple students. Um, the students have unit demand. So you only want to go to a single college, but colleges want a class of more than one, because having a class of one looks really, really bad for your uh, alumni donations. Um, agents, again, we're going to assume have strict preferences, but what are these preferences? Well, for students, it's easy. They just have rank orders over colleges, just like men had ranks over women. But the schools are going to have preferences over sets of students. And they'll, in particular, they'll have what we'll call responsive preferences that I promise you I will define in the next slide. Again, though, just you know, bullet point four, two-sided matching. And again, we're going to assume people fully know their preferences. And for colleges, you might think this is a reasonable assumption, that you sort of went and visited the six to 10 colleges that might be good matches, you know, reasonable matches for you, and you actually could rank them if you were forced to. Right? You know, maybe you don't think all day about you know, a strict ranking between college A and college B, but if you had to sort of do the trade-offs and come up with a strict preference rank, you could make that assessment and you know, theoretically turn them into a centralized matching mechanism. All right, that's the basic setting. What are responsive preferences that fill half the slide? Well, so I promise they're not messy, but they're going to be a little bit subtle to actually formally define. But like, look, look here first. The preferences PC, so this will be the, the general preference relation of the college over sets of students, are going to be defined to be responsive if they come from a complete transitive preference relation over students. So note here the parallelism with the prior notation. So this is a linear order of the students and a quota, Q sub C. So every school has a number of seats, and it has an individual ranking for the students. You can think about sort of every seat having the same ranking over students. Right? So it might be that, uh, you know, it might be that, um, well, who, who can I pick on here? Um, no, I really shouldn't. That would be dangerous. You know? It might be that Paul is preferred to me uh, by you know, the first seat of the school. That means that all the seats of the school prefer Paul to me. The school sort of independently thinks that Paul is cooler than I am. And so if it only had one seat, it would take you know, Paul if, he ha they, if it had the opportunity. But if it has two, it might put Paul into the first seat and me into the second. What do I mean to say consistent with? So the, the messy formalism is about saying what I mean to be consistent with this single linear ordering. It means that for any set of students S prime that doesn't hit the quota, and any two students I and J, the college prefers S prime with i to S prime with j if and only if i beats j in this linear ranking. So this means if you're, sort of, if you're below your quota and you have a seat that's open, it's going to choose the guy who's higher in the ranking first. Okay? And then the second component, you know, same thing. Um, you're going to want to take one of the, a student at all if and only if he's acceptable under the linear order. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the fellowship he gets depends on who else got there. Yep. So you have this sort of feedback complicated relationship. OK, this is a great and very uh, prescient slash foreshadowing question. So the question is, well, this looks a little bit strange, right? Colleges have tuition subsidies or financial aid. Um, you know, maybe you know, both the student's preference over colleges depend on the amount of tuition subsidy you get, right? So you'll go to, uh, you'll go to Stanford if you get full financial aid, uh, but you know, maybe otherwise you want to go to Harvard. Um, but, uh, um, and moreover, the school's ability to offer the financial aid is a function of who's shown up, right? You know, if they have a fellowship for sort of the top student in their entering class, you know, 
if number seven, Mr. Number Seven is the top student who, who applies, then he gets the fellowship. But if Mr. Number Two shows up, then he gets the fellowship. And so you know, it seems like there could be a feedback effect here. Well, it turns out, and I won't talk about it in today's lecture, but Paul will talk about it on Wednesday, and then I'll talk about it some more. Um, there's a very natural, well, actually, I guess I'll, I'll sort of preview it a little bit with my worker firm discussion at the end. But there's, a, it, there's generally a very natural way to think about using these matching mechanisms to not just match students to schools, but also students to schools with other finite parameter information. So tuition subsidies, um, you know, or uh, you know, majors or something like that, you know, specialties. Um, and there's sort of a, a huge broad theory on this that's built up uh, in what's called matching with contracts. And so for sure, that's a very important thing to be thinking about. And we will talk about it, I promise. Uh, but for now, I just want to talk about a world where we're just matching students to schools, because a lot of the real world markets actually do have this structure for either uh, you know, economist, uh, you know, usually for, for not economist imposed reasons, but sort of structural impediments to negotiating the contracts as part of the mechanism in the market. Uh, and then we will certainly come back to this. And it turns out, so key, so this feedback loop, remember, so uh, this feedback loop that was, that, he, that was just mentioned kind of feels like deferred acceptance, right? It's like, I, I propose to you, I will come to you if you give me this tuition cut. And they'll hold on to this tuition cut opportunity until they suddenly get, you know, Mr. One showing up and saying, you know, no, 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 I want the tuition cut. And they say, oh, sorry, Mr. Seven, you, you don't get uh, the top fellowship because Mr. One showed up. We're giving him the top fellowship. But now you might come back and propose, well, what about a 50% fellowship or something like that? And so if you think about you know, proposing marriage with dowries or you know, proposing workers, you know, workers proposing wage contracts or something like that, it's all going to sort of have this same sort of structure. Cool? Excellent. Good. Great question. Thank you. Um, you know, last basic definition, or sort of modeling definition, I suppose. Just as before, a matching is going to be a, oh, sorry, not one to one anymore, a correspondence. I apologize. There are two typos in this line. Uh, this is what happens when you check your slides when you're jet lagged. This is a many to one correspondence, and it's on S Union C. Uh, there was some version of these slides where I was doing things in terms of firms instead of colleges. But look at this. This is right. Each student is assigned a college or himself remaining unmatched. Each college is assigned a set of students, possibly empty. So this is the many to one matching structure. And then again, so now every student is in his matches assigned set of students. So the set, you know, the, the match is consistent in the sense that each student's match is the college that, to which he is assigned. OK? Uh, to, uh, this is a subset. So yes, it's an element of the power set or is a subset. Um, sorry, this is notationally hard to read. This is an element symbol, that's a subset symbol, and yes, they look basically the same. So I could have written this as mu of c is in the power set of s. Cool? Everyone see that? The, the, the big switch here, the, the sort of scary switch here was the symbol. <laughs> sorry, that was notationally, potentially should have made that bigger or something. Cool? What's stability? Well, it turns out that the same stability concept we had before is actually going to work. So a matching is going to be pairwise stable. Again, if everyone finds their matches uh, acceptable, so individually rational, nobody wants to unilaterally quit college, or no college wants to unilaterally drop students. And unblocked, I can't find a student in a college such that they mutually prefer each other to their assigned match. That means either the student beats some other student assigned to the college if the college is up to its quota, or just the student is acceptable and the college hasn't filled its quota. OK, so unblocking is it's the exact same concept. It's a student and a school who want to get together and match to each other rather than their assigned matches. But what it means for the college to want to match is more complicated. Cool? Footnote. Um, so there are lots of ways I could have written down this definition. So in one-to-one -one matching, this pairwise concept was sort of very natural, you know, blocking pairs. Here you might say the right notion of blocking isn't actually pairs. It's sort of group blocks. Lots of people get together and block at the same time. Uh, the good news is that under the responsive preferences assumption, and in fact under this more general substitutable preferences assumption, which I'll show you in a few minutes, these are actually the same concept. 
So looking at pairwise stability is without loss of generality. It's the same as the more general group stability, or sorry, more uh, stringent group stability notion you'd like to define. And so here I'm really doing this without loss of generality. Moreover, these are also the same as the core. So this also you know, echoes Eric's comment earlier about the linkage between the core and the set of stable outcomes. Sort of at this point, many to one matching without contracts, all of the solution concepts are more or less the same so long as we have this substitutability assumption. Uh, that was structure will start breaking down. So the more general you make these matching models, the more different the solution concepts get. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. But for now, again, sort of pairwise stability we can think about without loss of generality. Yes? Ah, should I adjust the volume which way? Up or down? Down. <laughs> uh, maybe I can adjust. Let me see. I have no idea. I'll just move this down, I guess. I am literally adjusting the volume down. Does that work? Can people still hear me? People in the back? Great. Excellent. Sorry, they made a huge deal about my having to put it really high up. Um, OK. So now, that's our you know, class of definitions. This is our college admissions model. Now let's like, think about it. I want to prove some theorems. So one of the incredibly beautiful things about this model is that as long as we have responsive preferences, theorems are not hard to prove. Why is that? Well, college admissions with responsive preferences is actually the same as one-to-one -one matching in a slightly different market. So now imagine that I replace each college with you know, QC seats. So give each seat its own individual guy. Remember I set up this metaphor at the beginning where I said, you know, think of each seat as having the same preferences? Well, that was, that was for cause. We're now going to do exactly that. We're now going to replace each college and the students' preferences with just, uh, you know, these individual colleges, you know, C, individual seats, C1 through CQC. And each of these seats, meanwhile, is going to have the same preferences as the college, you know, as, as the college's you know, individual ranking over students. So now we have a one-to-one -one market. And note that it's completely consistent with the student and college preferences, right? Every one of these seats behaves exactly as it did before. It takes the, you know, the best seat, student it can get. And in fact, you know, sort of, we can only assign each student one seat they're going to fill them in principle in the same order they would have filled them. Right? You know, the student who is most preferred by the school is going to get C1. Or a student who, who, who applies, who's most preferred by the school, is going to get C1. Yes. Oh, sorry. And so this absolutely gorgeous construction, um, which I guess actually is sort of both Roth Sotomayor 1990 and Roth 1985, I think, one of the like five Roth 1985 papers. Um, College admissions matching is stable if and only if the corresponding matching in this related, we'll call it the related market, is stable. And so now we're going to be able to like take these theorems, and this was part of the reason I put them in the same notation. Uh, we're going to be able to take the theorems that Eric talked about and that I talked about and level them up to many to one matching without too much work. So first of all, a stable college admissions matching exists. You know, we just proved existence without even having to talk about deferred acceptance because we've talked about deferred acceptance and one-to-one -one matching. Uh, you know, for reference, Gail Shapley in 1962 had this you know, stable matching result for college admissions as well, which should be a giveaway that deferred acceptance is going to work there too. There's student proposing deferred acceptance and college proposing deferred acceptance, and they look exactly the same. And again, as I said, these are, this deferred acceptance idea is going to generalize into these matching with contracts and other worlds. Moreover, um, you know, this kind of looks familiar too. There's going to be the same lattice structure. So if I give you two stable matchings, there's going to be a, you know, a college improvement and, a, stu and a, a student improvement. Colleges and students' interests are going to be opposed. And college and student optimal deferred acceptance are going to find the two endpoints of the lattice. So again, now we're just translating. We're passing everything through this theorem. It happens that you can give direct arguments for this. Uh, in fact, a lot of these were proven directly before they actually appeared through the translation proof. Yep? Uh, what do you do if you can't embed the seats within this construction of the college preferences? Great so question. Yeah, so very good question. Um, so the question is, in general, what happens if we don't have this type of seat construction? So I used responsiveness very strongly to make this work. Right? The fact that every seat treats every student, a college treats all the students the same way, 
and that the college's preferences even have this sort of uniform ordering over students. Right? Colleges might have rankings over sets of students that don't respect this structure. Um, I'll talk about that in a few minutes, and then we'll talk about it in a huge depth on Wednesday. Uh, but it turns out that there's a more general uh, set of these results that work whenever the students look like substitutes to the colleges. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the intuition for that right now, actually. Because this is, I've now said this twice, which means probably it should have been earlier in the slides. Um, because it's come up in questions before. Um, what is the intuition here? Well, when think about deferred acceptance. When I'm proposing in deferred acceptance, uh, it's very important that holding all the previously acceptable proposals makes sense. You sort of you never want to, and and hold, keeping track of all the rejections makes sense too. You never. It's important that the college never wants to take back a student it had already rejected, right? Because if it did, the fact that the students were moving straight down their preference orderings would no longer be consistent. Right? You know, I propose to my second choice school, it says, no way. Um, you know, I go and propose to my third and fourth and fifth choice. My fifth choice is holding me. Then Paul comes and proposes to my second choice school. And my second choice school says, oh, wow, Paul, we definitely want you. And you know what else? Now we want Scott again. Well, now I'm on hold at my fifth choice school. I'm also on hold at my second choice school. I'm being you know, dragged, you know, sort of in, you know, drawn and quartered across the country. This doesn't work. And so the question is, what can we do that guarantees that you never have to take back a rejection in the deferred acceptance algorithm. And that condition is what we call substitutability. Essentially, and again, I'm, I'm waving my hands a little bit, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you why uh, on Wednesday. But that's the core idea is that it's never the case that getting somebody else makes you want someone you've already rejected. So like, you know, getting Paul to, to show up at the school doesn't make them suddenly want me having rejected me. And so, a lot of these theorems are all going to go through. And uh, you know, later in the deck, I have a slide that says that most of these structure theorems go through as well under the substitutability assumption. But you have to give direct proofs. So you can't prove them using this cute trick that I'm using to do everything really quickly right now. Great question. Thank you. That all clear? <laughs> cool. All right. So now, remember the lone wolf theorem? Sorry? Remember the lone wolf theorem? This is the rural hospitals theorem. So lone wolf, remember, we were thinking about these guys who like being single, or women who like being single. Sorry, I should be, uh, you know, I should be uh, gender neutral. These people who like being single and are single at every stable match. Um, now let's think about hospitals. So I've talked about colleges and students, but the first you know, big real world application of deferred acceptance, in fact, before Gail and Shapley wrote their paper, was in the market for matching doctors to their medical residencies. When Al and Elliot Perenson got together to try and look at redesigning the medical residency match, as Al will tell you this afternoon, one of the things they said was, well, can't, you know, the rural hospitals never managed to get enough doctors. Is there any way we could sort of set up the mechanism to favor them, to give them a few more doctors? So unfortunately, there's a very strong no. So not only is there a generalization of the lone wolf theorem that says, at every stable matching, the same set of students are matched, and the same college positions are filled. So in particular, the rural hospitals weren't filling their positions. They never fill all their positions. Moreover, if you're a college that fails to fill all your positions in some stable matching, then in fact, you get the same set of students at every stable matching. So like, not only can we not sort of choose a stable match to get more doctors to rural hospitals, but we can't even choose a stable match to get the rural hospitals doctors they like more. They get the same set at every stable match. This is like a very, very sharp negative result. Um, so proof of the first part, this is the lone wolf theorem in our related one-to-one -one market. Right? Same set, of, you know, same set of students are matched, exactly the lone wolf theorem. The same set of students are matched. Same, set of, you know, same number of positions are filled. Well, that's, you know, we fill you know, C1 through C7, not the others. Well, C1 through C7, these are guys in a one-to-one -one market. They're matched at every stable matching. And that means, in particular, that exactly seven of College C's positions are filled at every stable match. Everyone see that? OK. How about the second part? So the second part's more subtle. There was a, a paper just about this one. Um, so it's more subtle. It gets three lines. And we'll talk through it in a little bit more detail, even than it's on the slide. So let's imagine we have some one of these uh, colleges that doesn't fill all of its positions at the end. 
Um, and let's, in particular, we know that they're going to fill the same number of positions. So if there's some stable match where you don't fill all your positions, then you don't fill all your positions at the college optimal stable match. So let's look at the college optimal stable match and this other stable match, mu. And like, suppose that you get a different doctor. At least one doctor is different between the two. Well, now I know, in particular, that there's some doctor in this set that's not, sorry, in this set that's not in this set. Right? Just that's the definition of being different. Well, that's a little odd. I know that that doctor prefers uh, C to whomever he's matched to under mu bar. Why is that? Lattice structure. Same type of argument as I used to prove the lone wolf theorem to you. Because we know that the college optimal stable matching is worse for the students, whomever the student got, you know, whomever the student got here has to be worse, whether it's being unmatched or being matched to some other college, has to be worse than in mu where he's matched to C. Does everybody see that? I see like slightly more tentative nodding, so I'm going to say it a second time. Is that okay? It's like lots of looping. Pick some student who's matched to C under mu, but not under mu bar. By lattice structure, he has to prefer mu, he has to prefer C to whomever he's matched to under mu bar, whether it's himself or some other college. But now, C has responsive preferences and an empty slot in mu bar, right? He didn't fill all his positions. So this student really wants to block, and C is willing to block with him. It has an open seat that it could give him. He's acceptable, because we know he's matched here. Given that he's acceptable, given that he wants that seat, the college would give it to him. So that contradicts this non-equality assumption. It must be that all the students in mu bar of C are exactly the students in mu of C. Cool? This, incidentally, is a theorem that looks much, much easier in retrospect. So the original, uh, the original proof of this was much harder in some sense. And there have been sort of many different refinements and generalizations of these rural hospitals ideas, including like um, just last couple of years. So there are generalizations of this that have floated around in a, bunch of, a lot of different parts of the literature. Just in the last couple of years, this piece has also been generalized to a number of different contexts. So like this is, you know, one thing I'll try and highlight a little bit later in the talk is that it's possible to prove new theorems about these very classical types of ideas still. You know, it's one of the amazing things about this field that there still remain really, really interesting theorems to find that like, in principle could have been proven 20 years ago, but there's just sort of so much rich structure and matching theory that people didn't get to them. Um, another quick footnote on rural hospitals that will come up. Um, you know, so plug, working in matching theory, good. Um, Cool theorems to prove. Um, another quick fact about the rural hospitals theorem. So in general, when we generalize the strategy proofness results that Eric gave, um, we actually often pass through versions of the rural hospitals theorem. So it's going to turn out that there will be generalizations of strategy proofness. We'll see a couple in the slide in a minute. Um, for the side of the market, for unit demand agents on the proposing side of the market, and the proof of that is often easiest to prove through the rural hospitals theorem. I think Paul is going to give us one version of that on Wednesday. Cool? All right. Ah, next slide. Sorry, I thought I was doing weak Pareto optimality first. Oh, I know why. Sorry, I'm not. I'm doing incentives before weak Pareto optimality because we need to talk about substitutes before we get there. Um, so incentives. Literally, we're going to talk about incentive results right here. First of all, student optimal stable matching. Dominant strategy for each student to state his true preferences. Uh, moreover, no other stable matching mechanism makes it a dominant strategy for each student to state true preferences. How do we prove this one? Uh, this one is very quick. One line. Use the incentives theorems from the related market. It's a one-to-one -one matching market. Deferred acceptance is deferred acceptance. Student proposing looks exactly the same. It's very quick to show that they correspond. And so strategy proofness of student optimal stable matching in the related market gives you strategy proofness of student, student optimal stable matching in this market. And the same, except you have to add in all the, uh, the, the not quantifiers to do this one, I guess, via contrapositive in the one-to-one -one market. Cool? Again, this, this related market thing is really, really powerful. But you can prove versions of all these theorems without having to pass through it. Uh, meanwhile, 
At the very end, Eric mentioned truncation. So any, under any stable matching mechanism, any student who can gain by lying about his preferences can do so by truncating his preference list. This again is going to come out of the one-to-one -one market result. Meanwhile, you know, so this implies, and I'll click both of these on at once, this implies that when the college optimal stable matching mechanism is used, the only students who can gain are those who get a different match in the student optimal stable matching mechanism. So this again is hearkening to this idea that Eric gave us that you know, when you truncate your preference list, you're not creating any new blocks, right? You're sort of just moving around the set of, you know, in the set of stable matchings. And so this is going to tell us that if you're running college optimal stable matching and you students do the optimal truncations, then in particular they're going to get sort of towards this, they're going to move up the lattice towards the student optimal stable match. And so this opposition, they're going to sort of move to any, some other stable match. It's going to be weakly better for them than the college optimal stable match, right? Just by lattice structure alone. So again, sort of lots of underlying structure here. Just by knowing a little bit about lattice structure, you know, and, and the, sort of what optimal dominant strat or optimal um, deviation strategies look like, we can say sort of very broad things about how the set of stable matches is affected by people's strategic manipulation. Last slide on incentives, and this is different. So, you know, red flag, this is not an analog of a result from the other side, or from one-to-one -one matching. No stable matching mechanism exists. So this includes college optimal stable matching, for which stating true preferences is a dominant strategy for every college. OK, so before we had you know, woman optimal stable matching made true stating true preferences is a dominant strategy for the women. In fact, it turns out that as soon as one agent can have multiple partners, that agent you know, gets a second type of strategic deviation, which we call dropping strategies, which get us away from strategy proofness. So good, I think we have time to actually go through this example. Um, so this is the single scariest example I will put on the board, um, I promise. We have three colleges. The first one has quota two, that's this one. And the other two have quota one. We have four students, although all the action is going to be in these first three guys. So what happens? So I want, to, I want to hope that college optimal stable matching makes it a dominant strategy for colleges to state their true preferences, right? That would be the dream. So let's propose, let's do college optimal stable matching and see what happens. So college one proposes to students one and two. College two proposes to student one, and college three proposes to student three. So now, student one is the guy who got two proposals, right? He has college one and two. He keeps college one. Each of these other guys, student two has college one, student three has college three. So student, uh, student two stays at college one, and student three stays at college three. It's college two who's been rejected. He proposes again, proposes now to student two. Student two, aha, I like C2, college two more than college one. So long, Mr. One. Student two moves to college two, and now it's college one's turn to propose. He moves down his preference list. Remember, he's still holding student one. But now he also proposes to student three. Student three, huge windfall. I just got an offer from my top choice college. <coughs> student three accepts, or hold, holds rather. But now college three has to move down its list, and it proposes to student one. And student one leaves college one. Last step, college one proposes to college four. And we get the stable matching where college one gets students three and four. And what happened? So college one looked really good, right? Students one and two actually liked it a lot. Yet somehow it didn't get either of them. It gets down to students three and four in the end. It's least favorite students. Does anyone notice what happened? Head shaking. It's kind of a whirlwind. I had to rethink this again this morning. So try and absorb this uh, because it's very hard to remember like all the dynamics. And you often just have to rework through it. So what happened is college one sort of faked himself out. He was holding student one, thinking that if he proposed to student three, he'd get both student one and student three. But in fact, as soon as he took student three, 
College 3 went after student 1. And so he sort of tricked himself. You know, but he was too clever by half. By proposing to student 3, he lost his most favorite student, which makes him worse off under responsive preferences. And so what he really would have liked to do is drop you know, students 2 and 3, or, you know, and pretend that he didn't find either of them acceptable. And then he would have gotten student 1 and student 4, which is strictly better for him. I know that this only makes sense. You only have these sorts of you know, chain reaction effects when you have multiple slots, when it's possible to use a slot to get somebody who will free up a space that will take away from someone else you're holding at the same time. And so this is the difference. You know, this is the first big difference we've seen between many-to-one and one-to-one -one matching. And, the, and you know, this structure is permanent now. So as soon as you have one side that takes multiple partners, that side is never going to be able to be made strategy proof. The full generalization of the strategy proof this result will be that unit demand agents on the proposing side have a dominant strategy to state their true preferences. OK? So they looked really similar. I just, I just sort of showed you, oh, it, your responsive preferences, it's the same. It's not quite the same. And the more we generalize the models, the more sort of these pieces of structure are going to start peeling apart. And we'll see sort of what's really at the core of matching and what's sort of special to the preference structure or to the very specific you know, model we're considering. All right? Cool. Yep. Sorry, question. Yes. So um, is there any difference in a mechanism where the college is only allowed to propose at one new agent in every step? Uh, or does, is that equivalent? Uh, should be equivalent, I believe. Um, I don't know. Do you know off the top of your head? I think it should be the same, right? Yes, should be, it's equivalent. I don't know whether anybody's explicitly written that particular version of the algorithm down. Um, I should say. Yes. So I don't know whether anyone's, I'm sure someone at some point has written that specific version of the algorithm down, but I don't think I've seen it. Um, I should say, however, that a lot of times people will write down you know, a deferred acceptance-like algorithm, except instead of all the men walking across and proposing, one man at a time proposes. That, that's yep. Started that's true. You're right. You're right. Sorry. So I was about to say, and then Eric proved that, the order, that it's order independent. Order, order doesn't matter, right. including doing things simultaneously or not simultaneously. Right. Um, although, exactly. So uh, order doesn't matter. Uh, although, as we, again, as the models get more general. Order might matter to, to the centers, though. Uh, um, well, if it's the student, if it's, say, student optimal stable matching, uh, we'll always get the same outcome independent of order. So it won't affect incentives either, right? Well, who, who you, who you uh, if you could propose to a pair. Ah, yeah, sorry, in, in these types of settings. Yeah, yeah, if you, if, right, if you have non-unit demand preferences, for sure. That's right, that's right. Um, but yeah, so in general, the order won't matter for the, uh, for the outcome. Um, again, given preference assumptions. So responsiveness here will work, substitutability will work. Even a weaker thing, which we'll talk about briefly on Wednesday, called bilateral substitutability, is going to give you the same order independence fact. Um, but that's like, a, in more general models, that's a fact you actually prove. It's, it's not immediately obvious. Um, OK, very quickly, this is, I already talked about this, so I'm going to go through this slide very, very briefly. But we say that a college's preferences are substitutable if for every uh, student's I, pair of students i and j and some other set of students s prime, if you don't choose i when you just have s prime and i, then you also don't choose i when you suddenly gain access to j. So if your opportunity set expands, it doesn't make you want something you were previously rejecting. This is this idea I gave before that there's no school for which you know, it's got some entering class. right? It's got you know, Al and Eric. Um, it says, you know, no way, Scott, not interested in you. But then when Paul shows up, they say, oh, OK, now there's, a comp there's complementarity between you know, Paul and Scott. So I'll take Paul, and I'll also take Scott. We're ruling that out. Uh, in fact, literally right here, there is no student that sometimes complements J in the sense that gaining access to, sorry, J makes I more attractive. Interesting. There's a, an almost analogous thing on the Wednesday slides, and I'll have to check and make sure that's in the right order, too. So, yep. In practice, colleges are often interested in, in diversity. So right. So you want to have some athletes, you want to have some, some scholars. Yes. Uh, now, within, within each of these groups, you may have substitutability, but not across. Is, is, there, is there anything you could say about that? 
Yes. Um, <laughs> Right. In that context, there's still substitutes. So if there are athletes and there's a best athlete, you know, sort of independent, you know, then for sure. They, you still have substitutable preferences. You might just have different types of students you take. Um, so if athletes substitute for athletes and, uh, you know, and uh, I don't know, matching theorists substitute for matching theorists, you're still fine. There'll be a, a generalization of this condition where I can sort of give people, actually, that's fine under this. But even more if we add sort of type information and so forth. Um, that's totally fine. The issue is when a college is looking to build a class and it's saying, wow, you know, we're thinking about opening up a, a, a new, I don't know, soccer team, a football team. Um, and, you know, we really need sort of a bunch of guys who work together if we're going to start this up. And so they only want to admit, you know, uh, midfielders if I should not have picked soccer. I don't know anything about it. I just heard the World Cup's going on. <laughs> They're only going to admit matching theorists. Um, if they know they can also get sort of game theorists to work with them or something like that, and then you might have non-substitutabilities. Um, there, there are some conditions in specifically many-to-one matching with contracts where certain types of non-substitutabilities are OK. I'll talk about them. But in general, at least in sort of small markets, you need substitutability to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes. Um, in large markets, sometimes that goes away, although we don't know exactly how quickly. Sort of, you know, very large markets, some types of complementarity aren't problems anymore. Uh, sorry, that was a huge, the, this will be a, the topic of an entire lecture on, uh, on Wednesday, so I'm going to not go into too much of it right now. But it's a very important question that Eric raises that you know, if you're thinking about doing matching in an application, you have to think about whether we believe the substitutability assumption um, or whether there's a weakening of it that'll make sense for the specific application. Um, and then as I said earlier, we can't use this related one-to-one -one market construction, so we're actually going to have to prove a lot of these results directly. And there are direct proofs. Um, some of which are, in some sense, even, in my, like, even more sort of structurally elegant. Like, there turns out to be a fixed point characterization of the set of stable matches that sort of really shows you exactly what they are. Um, and that, that'll let us get a grip on not just many to one matching, but even higher generalizations. Um, so, I promised to talk a little bit about things that are sort of like modern results that live in this classical space. So, Fuhiro Kojima, while well, he was in grad school, I guess wrote the generalization of weak Pareto optimality. The student optimal stable matching is weakly Pareto optimal for many to one matching. In some sense, if and only if. So we'll talk about that. It's a maximal domain result. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. But essentially, if and only if the preferences of every college are substitutable and satisfy this additional condition that's called the law of aggregate demand, or sometimes cardinal monotonicity, it says when you get more students to choose from, s prime bigger than s, prime prime, you choose weekly more of them. So there's no student who does the job of two of them. And so you know, this result looks sort of a lot like that classical weak Pareto optimality result from the 80s I showed you, but was proven you know, by somebody who's almost our age. Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, even more recently, Asaf Ram, who will be speaking later in the summer school, uh, showed that you know, there's another there's a classic welfare comparative static result uh, in, the, in Roth and Sotomayor that again, sort of the right conditions you need to generalize this result are substitutability in the law of aggregate demand. So this substitutable preference structure, which is you know, a, a much less restrictive structure than responsiveness, uh, sort of when you put a little bit more on it, you get back sort of very strong forms of a lot of these results. And you even uncover that you, know, you need exactly this structure. In some sense, substitutability and the law of aggregate demand are really fundamental to a lot of these baseline results for matching. And because they're both automatic in one-to-one -one matching, we didn't notice that before. It's so like, you guys could go and prove theorems of this type, like really, truly. Uh, you know, both of these are you know, last couple of years and, and proven by people in grad school as projects. All right, I promised a couple remarks on many-to-many -many matching. Um, this is literally the only slide in many-to-many -many matching. If you want to know uh, absurdly large amounts about it afterwards, come and talk to me. Um, so uh, there are many definitions of suitability. So the big thing that breaks down when you go to many-to-many -many matching is that not all of the or the stability definitions coincide in general. And so there's a lot of different papers that propose different sort of arguably correct definitions. And there's some independent motivations, you know, usually coming from different applied problems. Um, you know, if you look at some of the more recent ones, Echenique and Oviedo in particular give sort of an index to all of these you know, different conditions that were around at the time. Um, 
pairwise stability no longer coincides with the core. So this is an example of uh, Charlie Blair, or Chuck Blair, I guess. Um, you know, very early it was realized that sort of one of the things that broke down in many-to-many -many matching was this nice linkage between stability and the core. Uh, although it turns out when we it add back in when we add in transfers, uh, we can get that back. But for sort of fully general many-to-many -many matching without transfers, we don't have that. Uh, moreover, we only get pairwise stability as the same as stability when we have substitutability. So again, this substitutability condition is showing itself to be really important. But again, sort of nevertheless, the real takeaway message is that. Does stability still mean the core? Ah, no, sorry. Stability means. Um, I don't have a, do I have a quick way to get there? Yes, I do. No, I don't, apparently. I'm sorry. Um, yoink. My apologies. I don't have a quick way to get to that slide. Usually I have an index. Um, but stability means now this you know, combination of individual rationality and unblockedness. So it's not core stability. It's not that there's no coalition that can get together and make themselves mutually better off. It's that um, both nobody wants to walk away from their match unilaterally, and I can't get together now a group of agents that together mutually want to deviate and match with each other, possibly keeping some of their old matches. And that's the big distinction from the core. Although also note that core blocks don't, usually are not assumed to be individually rational. It's the group can get together and make itself better off but doesn't actually have to sort of take its, its full improvement. It could improve further on that. Um, make sense? OK, let's talk about that one offline. <laughs> um, it probably means I didn't do a good job of explaining, but still, let's, let's defer that. Um, but the, you know, the basic you know, underlying bottom line, there's sort of lots of sort of questions about how you choose the right solution concept. But a lot of these theorems extend in natural ways. And we'll see even more general generalizations um, for existence of stable outcomes, rural hospitals under the law of aggregate demand, uh, you know, the best incentive results you can have, all of this stuff. Cool? So that's many-to-many -many matching in a single slide whirlwind. There's tons of stuff here that I have not covered. This is mostly just to make you aware that it exists. All right. We've got 15 minutes left. In the last 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about two-sided, many-to-one matching with transfers. So why is this? So first of all, this links back to the first part of Eric's talk. So remember, we had these one-to-one -one markets with you know, dowries or, or, or prices. Um, this is going to be the many-to-one generalization thereof. Uh, this is also going to be the bridge that's going get to get us to matching with contracts. So when we start talking on Wednesday about adding salaries and other terms of exchange into the contract space, um, it's going to sort of look a lot structurally like the types of things that were found in Kelso Crawford 1982, um, even though the, like, the analysis and the methods and the generality are going to be much, uh, much stronger. So basic theorem, in two-sided, many-to-one matching markets with bilateral contracts, so again, we're matching you know, only with pairs, transferable utility, so many-to-one matching, sorry, not matching only pairs, but each match, you know, match is a pair. So workers say matching to firms. Be careful about my language. Transferable utility. So now there are going to be salaries, not necessarily continuous salaries. And substitutable preferences, which I'm about to give you a different definition of in terms of these salaries. Competitive equilibria exist, and they coincide with both stable and core outcomes. So I just finished telling you about all these things where like, all the solution concepts fell apart. Now, now put them all back together. We're in many to one matching with transfers. All the solution concepts are going to align again. OK? So very quickly, um, apologies for switching notation. I'm doing this in Kelso Crawford's notation. So here we have M workers and N firms. And again, this is going to be sort of very summary style, many to one matching. The workers' preferences incorporate both wages and employers, but no externalities. They don't care who their colleagues are. The firms, meanwhile, care about the wages they're paying and who their employees are. And the firm's preferences are going to be what are called gross substitutes. So the gross condition, you know, think about these as substitutes. This is equivalent to the substitutability condition I gave you sort of when you write it down correctly. Um, and it's not really, you know, the, the, the gross qualifier doesn't make as much sense ex post now that we sort of understand how these link up with the other substitutability concepts. Um, but you'll see it called gross substitutes a lot still in the literature. Uh, so workers are gross substitutes for a firm J. If for any two salary vectors, sj and sj prime, such that 
sj is less than or equal to sj prime. So let's think about what this inequality means. So you're a firm. Do you want salaries to be high or low? Low, right, good. So this. Yes, yeah, yeah. So good. So in a minute, we're going to talk about you know, what workers you get in their productivity. Um, but like sort of independent of, all of your actual demand function, you know, if you've got the same set of workers, you'd prefer them to be low. So think about these. These are the salaries you're paying. It's, the reason for this is because the sign of this change is going gonna, is gonna to depend on that fact. Now, for every set of workers that I demand, so D will be our demand set at salary level SJ, there's some y prime, so some we have to do this, you know, y prime in instead of y prime equal to deal with multi-unit demand. Once we have salaries, there might be indifferences, but this is this is purely technical gunk. You can think about this as y prime equals the demand set. Um, there's some set of workers demanded under S J prime, such that every worker whose salary didn't change, so salaries went up. I want to look at the workers whose salaries didn't change. I still want them. OK, so this means you know, I raise the cost of some worker to you. You don't want to fire anyone you were holding before. Sorry, you don't want to fire anyone you were holding before whose salary did not change, whose salary did not, who didn't become more costly. In terms of goods, this feels a lot like you know, the price of you know, good A goes up. This doesn't make me want less of good B. That feels a lot like B is not a complement for A. Right? It's not peanut butter and jelly, where when there's a, you know, a huge run on the peanut butter market, suddenly now jelly is worthless because you know, there's no peanut butter to be had. Um, you guys don't like, you know, I mean, unless you like you know, peanut butter only sandwiches, in which case, there are jelly only sandwiches, in which case I don't know what to say. Um, but so that's the idea here. And so this feels a lot like this substitutability condition I showed you earlier, right? You know, getting a new opportunity. Or uh, doesn't make you want an opportunity you've already rejected. It turns out, and we'll see this in more detail, that these are really sort of, in some sense, exactly the same condition. That if we sort of turn these salaries into individualized contracts uh, that are in the opportunity set of the firms and workers, this gross substitutes condition is going to coincide with the substitutes condition I gave you before. So now, very quickly, why do we make the substitutability assumption? It's actually going to be exactly the same reason as we needed it in the matching markets. Think about a salary adjustment process. You know, firms face a set of salaries. They make offers to their most preferred set of workers. Any previous offer that was not rejected must be honored. So you're never going to you know, chuck an offer that you made without it being turned down. Workers look at their offers and tentatively hold their best acceptable offers. For each rejected offer, we raise the salary and try again. You know, uh, and if no new offers are made, we you know, try again if we want to. And if no new offers are made, we terminate the process and implement the assigned matching. So does, uh, does that sound familiar? You know, theorem, uh, the salary adjustment process terminates. The final allocation is generically unique. And the final outcome is in the core and firm optimal. Very, very similar. Feels a lot like firm proposing deferred acceptance, except we added this additional tweak that I'm going to propose salaries with it. Or you know, if we were in a marriage market, I'm proposing dowries or you know, buyer-seller prices. And we're getting exactly, oh, sorry, there's my sound familiar. I knew I had it somewhere here. Um, you know, we're getting exactly these competitive equilibrium prices that we saw in Eric's lecture. Um, now, oh, didn't quite, we're not quite necessarily, I didn't say, I mentioned that it's discrete or continuous. If we have continuous salary adjustment, then we get the competitive equilibrium prices. If we have discrete salary adjustment, we get sort of very close in a formal sense that you can prove. Um, but in, fact, in both circumstances, whether we have discrete or continuous salaries, all of this is going to go through, and we get sort of stable outcomes in this world of matching with salaries. Um, and moreover, substitutability is exactly the condition that's stopping the firm from wanting to take back an offer that it already made, right? So again, we see substitutability is really important. It turns out it is necessary here in the maximal domain sense. If there's one agent without substitutable preferences, then you can find substitutable preferences for everyone else such that no stable matching exists. Um, yes? I'm supposed to run the salary adjustment process. Mm -hmm. There must be some sort of linear ordering when it goes to salaries times workers, right? So you can make adjustments of salaries and together with adjustments to the set of workers to whom you propose. 
Um, I'm, so I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So linear ordering over what? So I should somehow combine them into one order. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Good point. Um, yes, now I understand. So the question is, how on earth do we get these proposal rules? How do they know which, you know, how to evaluate whether they actually want to make offers and, and the workers, you know, decide which salaries to look at? Um, you know, what does it mean, the most preferred set of workers? And the question was, is there a linear order? And yes, so there's a linear order over now, you know, sets of workers with their associated wages, right? But equivalently, we can think about this just in terms of a demand function. Given sort of a complete salary vector, the same thing as having this linear order is saying, I can write down my demand function for every set of salaries. And so it turns out that, like, you know, so Kelso Crawford wrote their paper in demand language. Um, but, you know, at least when I, when I have a finite salary space, say, it's very easy to convert this into an order over sets of worker salary, you know, worker salary contracts. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah, good. OK. Um, and so I wrote it down in demand language, but we'll see that that's sort of, you know, both, you know, sort of equivalent to another way of thinking about this, in which case it looks much, even more like our original many to one matching model. OK. Um, everyone happy with that? That was like the, the most whirlwind tour of Kelso Crawford ever. Like, you know, it's, and this paper, I should say, this paper has tons of stuff in it. So it's, it was sort of written you know, from a different edge of the literature. And so a lot of the like, language and notation, one sec, is very different from a lot of the other things I've shown you. And I sort of tried to put the language into as much anal anal analogy with what we've said so far as possible. But this paper is you know, very, very deep. And there's lots of interesting stuff in it. So it's another one I recommend you go and read the original of, um, possibly like sitting next to matching with contracts to look at the, uh, the parallel and relationship. Yes? Um, that's okay. So the question is budgets. Um, so we're going to assume. So usually, when people write down these models formally, they assume there's like a highest and lowest salary, sort of so high that you would never hire any workers. That's above sort of your maximum utility from a set of workers. So you never actually have to hit sort of a all money in the universe budget. But it's true that we do usually work with fully continuous transfer spaces, sort of allowing you to make offers as large or small as you'd want. However, in certain circumstances, the budget constraint. Doesn't so sometimes budget constraints can look like complementarities and sometimes not. But I'm going to leave that to Paul when he talks about the salary adjustment process and generality, what's called the cumulative offer algorithm. Yes. Yep. Um, a Giffen good effect. So the, I don't know whether I would label it a Giffen good effect, uh, but. Definitely, sometimes having budget constraints creates complementarity-like effects, even though sort of your underlying preferences over goods are substitutable. I think actually the story is this also sometimes comes up in auctions, where um, you know the the people walk in with sort of lists of their true valuations over say classes of spectrum, you know, overlapping blocks of spectrum, but they also come in with a budget constraint that's been set by some independent party, and so like you know you have truly substitutable preferences that would allow you to spend more than your budget constraint, except you have this sort of nonsensical constraint. And I think you can make some money off these types of strategy, off uh, these types of strategies. But uh, I'll, I'll leave that one to Paul's talk. <laughs> um, but yeah, great question. So sorry, one sec. Let me, let me finish the wrap on that. Great question. So introducing budget constraints can break substitutability, even if your underlying preferences look substitutable. Yes? <coughs> Mm -hmm. So, and seeing whether the results really correspond to, to the field. That's a great question. So the question. Uh, let me just mention sure. some externalities, so to speak. Often, people don't really uh, look for the best, you know, salary offer mm -hmm. because they are anxious. Yep. So sometimes they accept the uh, first offer. Yep. Even though they could later on, a week later, get a better offer, or two days later, get a better offer from uh, Enterprise B. But I come back 
because of all of these externalities and uh, psychology, the p behavioral uh, factors. Is there a way of testing the yeah. correspondence between theory and actual practice? OK, so you're winning the prescient question prize for the day. Um, so that question had about three different parts. Um, question one, can we test whether the assumptions of our models, may, of the matching models, of the types I've given today or their generalizations actually hold in reality? Question two, you know, there are some like, very specific things we might think are wrong. Right? For example, uh, people might be risk averse, which means they get an offer, say, from their second choice hospital. You know, it's their second choice hospital, and maybe it comes with an explosion. You know, it's gonna, this offer expires on Wednesday. Today is Monday. Um, happens all the time, right? Academic job market, too. Uh, maybe if on you know, Monday you're really happy, on Tuesday you're really anxious, and maybe on Tuesday night at 5 p.m. you close a business, you say, you know, I'll take it. And then four days later you hear from your first choice hospital, hey, we love you, we want to take you. Uh, well, unfortunately, you've already signed with your second choice. Um, so this happened, happens in real markets all the time. Uh, Al will talk some about how problems of exactly this form led to the establishment of a centralized medical match. So the reason they centralized was because not only was this effect with people you know, taking early offers happening, but now think about the equilibrium. If people are accepting offers on you know, March 15th, now you, you, know, you call people on March 30th, you learn that they got offers on March 15th. You say, well, next year I'll make mine on March 1st. And they just move earlier and earlier and earlier. Because sort of even though everyone agrees that the, match, the offers should be later, conditional when everyone's making theirs, you want to make yours earlier. So this type of unraveling effect really does come up. And the third one was, what about sort of other behavioral factors? Um, how about explaining mechanisms to people? If we're actually going to use stable matching in practice and tell people, you know, you, it is a dominant strategy for you to state your true preferences. Do they even believe this? You know, we had some like economists show up and say, attention, we are implementing a new mechanism. It will rely on some very famous mathematical results due to Gale and Shapley, 1962. Um, trust us. State your true preferences. If you're looking for the reference, look at Roth 1982 or Dubin's and Friedman 1981. Turns out that sometimes that works, and sometimes people get really confused. And so there's a great interplay between theory and experiment and practice just in the, in the exercise of sort of figuring out how people behave in these markets. And so you can try and train them to understand the mechanism better and use it sort of to, to better social welfare purpose. And the first part of the question, so, so I, I answered parts two and three. Part one, very quickly, can you test all of these assumptions? Uh, yes, we're getting there. You know, so some of them, for sure. Sometimes people use stability as an assumption and use that to try and back out parameters of the market. That's been going on for at least a decade. Uh, very famous papers there by Chu and Sayao and uh, Galish Chon and Salinier. Uh, Pierre-André Chiapori and company have a, a number of those. Um, but even more, sort of, very recently, like, like Nikhil Agarwal's job market paper of a, you know, a year ago, um, people are getting very detailed ways to use sort of structure and detailed features of real world matching markets to learn a lot about preferences and simulate how, you know, exactly how well the assumptions match and what would happen if you change the mechanisms around. This is an extremely active area of current research, uh, which we'll hear about when Attila Abdekataroglu speaks in a couple of days. So I think with that, we should break. QED.